Uh, welcome to worship today. Uh, we have with us a guest minister since Pastor Bob is on vacation this week, uh, the Reverend Phyllis Palsma, who is Director of Pastoral Care at Christian Healthcare Center, will be leading worship for us. I just want to remind everybody that we are not meeting here in person next week. We are participating in a, a Reformed Church-wide worship service, which will be emailed out to you uh, later this week. Uh, it was pre-recorded, and uh, there will be instructions through email. Uh, for those who don't have email, we apologize, but it's giving us a chance to have a break. Pastor Bob is on vacation next week, and that allows us to worship with the rest of our brethren at the Reformed Church of America. Right now, I'll pass this on to Reverend Paulsma for the call to worship. Let me begin by saying it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. As Kathy said, I work at the Christian Healthcare Center where I'm the Director of Pastoral Care, and I want to bring you greetings today from the other chaplains who work there as well. There are four of us. And to say also thank you. Uh, this has been an especially trying time uh, for every nursing home uh, in the Northeast during the past few months, and we covet the prayers that you have lifted up for our residents and for our staff and pray that you will continue to pray for us during this time as we begin to reopen some activities. There are all kinds of rules and regulations about what we can do and cannot do. I'm sure you're aware of those, but we are praising God that we're beginning to move in a, in a positive direction as uh, we hope someday soon to bring visitors on campus, but I don't know what soon means um, in today's world. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. As we come to worship God, we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him and tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. God has called us together to be his people and to hear his good news. So let us worship and greet this day with the words of the psalmist, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We gather as a people of hope. Remembering these words from our Heidelberg Catechism, the writer asks, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And we respond, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Receive the blessing God sends to us. 
The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I invite you to turn and just to greet one another. Wave, smile, smile with your eyes. <laughs> we are God's people indeed. We come to praise and to hear the words of hope, but we also come to God to admit who we are before God and our neighbor. So let us therefore take a few moments to confess to God who we truly are. Let us pray. Awesome and compassionate God, you have loved us with unfailing, self-giving mercy, but we have not always loved you. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and in truth. We admit our sin and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Amen. We are assured of God's grace and forgiveness in these familiar words from John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. This is good news. And so we are free to go forth and live in the peace to which Christ calls us. Let us remember these words. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly beloved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. O oh Lord, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen to this word of the Lord as it comes to us from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, 
a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, this week, the sun sets on August, and September makes its appearance. I don't know about you, but it doesn't feel like it should be that way yet, but it is. And I am aware that the pinks and purples of the summer flowers in my garden and the yards all around me will soon give way to shades of orange and yellow and the vibrant red hues of autumn. And some of those red hues will show up in the burning bush plant. It's a type of euonymus shrub that dots the landscape of many suburban New Jersey neighborhoods. Elizabeth Barrett Browning beautifully writes of the burning bush in the seventh book of her epic poem, Aurora Lee. She writes this, Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries, and daub their natural faces unaware. End of her quote. I'm struck by that image of every bush of fire with God. It's a reminder that God is present in the ordinary and the mundane things of life. A burning bush figures prominently in our story from Exodus this morning. A bush that was aflame but not consumed by fire. The bush from which Moses heard God's voice and God's call to help his people. An ordinary thing made extraordinary thanks to the presence of God. Now I suspect most of you here know something of the story of Moses. Maybe you've watched with a grandchild or a child that Disney movie, The Prince of Egypt, which made it quite an adventure to watch. Or maybe you saw Cecily DeMille's epic, The Ten Commandments. The movies dramatically lead the viewer on a journey that begins with Moses' birth as a Hebrew and the threat to his life. And we watch as baby Moses is sent down the river in a basket, is rescued by Pharaoh's daughter who adopts him and raises him to be royalty. When he discovers his true identity as the son of Hebrew slaves, he falls from the life of privilege in the Egyptian court to one of servitude and poverty as he works alongside other Hebrew slaves in the mud pits of Egypt. And as our scripture opens today, we find Moses in a desolate place. He's been hiding out there for about 40 or so years. You see, he had run away from Egypt after he killed an Egyptian taskmaster 
who was abusing a Hebrew slave. And while on the run from Pharaoh, he met his wife, Zipporah, and he met his father-in-law, Jethro, a Midianite priest. Now, living in desolate wilderness, he has the job of shepherding his father-in-law's sheep. It's a humble task and a lonely one. And we find Moses with the flocks in a place far away from their home base in Midian at a mountain called Horeb. And Moses is simply doing his job when suddenly God gets his attention. Does that ever happen to you? You know, you're simply going around your day, doing your job, minding your own business, tending your own sheep, so to speak, in a place that seems quite ordinary, that doesn't have much meaning to you or to anyone else, but something out of the ordinary happens. And God calls your name. God gets your attention. There are times in our lives when, like Moses, we've been lonely, or we've been disoriented, been confused, and we've cried out, God, do you hear me? Would you light something on fire around here and speak to me? And maybe, like so many people, you felt that at some point since mid-March. This coronavirus pandemic has left us disoriented, bored, distressed, even depressed. And we wonder if and how God is going to show up. We look for something dramatic, but that doesn't seem to happen. So we just press on through ordinary days and ordinary activity. And that's how it is for Moses, until he notices a common bush is doing something uncommon. He moves closer and sees this flaming, crackling, fiery shrub that burns but is not consumed. It's just a bush, an ordinary bush like any other, until God gets hold of it. And in the ordinary of his life, Moses is given attention by God. God calls his name, and the dusty ground on which he stands becomes holy ground, because God is there. Moses takes off his sandals, and he stands barefooted on the mountainside, grounded and rooted in the presence of God, as he is called to serve God in an extraordinary way. You see, God has been listening to Moses all of his life. And God has been listening to the cries of his people in Egypt who beg to be released from Pharaoh's enslavement. God listens to us today. And God is listening to the cries of his people as they weep tears of frustration and anger and fear through this pandemic, through economic struggle, through racial injustice, through ugly words thrown around in political partisanship, through loss of home and life to hurricanes and wildfires. And as God listens, God calls people to turn aside and listen for God's call through the ordinary things of our lives. In this mountainside encounter, Moses is called back to God. And from the burning bush, God says to him, I am the God of your father. He trusted me, just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob trusted me. And I suspect Moses also remembers that his mother trusted God too when she packed him in a waterproof basket and sent him on a river ride down through the reeds into the hands of the woman who saved his life and raised him. As Moses mulls this over, God continues to get his attention. God says, I have observed the misery of my people. I have heard their cry. I know their suffering. 
and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. And I can imagine that when Moses hears that, there's a little yippee that goes on in his head. Hooray, God is finally going to come and do something about this horrible situation. God is going to rescue God's people. But listen to what God says next. So Moses, come. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of the land of Egypt. And Moses thinking, oh yeah, right. God is going to deliver God's people by sending Moses. Moses is being called to enact God's desire for the people. And the writer of Exodus tells us of Moses' resistance. As the story continues, Moses comes up for all kinds of excuses for why he can't do the job. And God constantly and consistently reassures Moses, I am with you. I am present. You will not be alone when you face the strongest political power of the day to set my people free. The burning bush is a story of call and response, of resistance and reassurance. Something is called for in the name of God, and then God calls someone to respond in God's name. The burning bush experience does not happen apart from or in spite of everyday life, but in the midst of life, in the day-to-day -day of our routine. That's what Moses was doing when this happened. He was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, doing the ordinary things of his life, the same thing he did the day before and every day before that for months, perhaps even years. Burning bushes show up as we keep our routine and everyday life. Marriage, parenting, work, friendships, errands, church, reading the news, mundane household tasks. And I wonder how God may be speaking to you through the interruptions or disruptions in your life today and to what God calls you. And how will you respond to that call? What if we saw every common bush afire with God and treated the places on which we stand as holy ground? This space in which you sit now as holy ground space permeated with the presence of God. How would that change how we as a people treat one another as a church, in our families, as a community, or even as a nation? We individually will probably not be called upon to do anything as grandiose as leading a nation of people into a new way of life, as Moses was. But God does call us to stand and to speak to the injustices of our day. And God calls us to stand and to behave in ways that model God's peace and grace and love for all God's people. We are invited to proclaim God who gives joy and delight and who fashions our everyday lives so that our activities in the world reflect our identity in God. One does not feed the hungry or care for the undocumented immigrant or for the environment because these things are just the in thing to do, but rather because our ways of being and doing flow from our identity as God's messengers as God's voice in the world. Back to those words of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush of fire with God. But only he or she who sees takes off his or her 
shoes. Take off your shoes. Stand barefooted. For ordinary ground is holy ground. The writer of Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 17, reminds us in the church today that through faith in Jesus Christ, we are rooted and grounded in love. And by that love of Jesus, we are assured that God calls us, abides with us, and will not abandon us. The common bush is a fire with God whose spirit flames within each of you each and every ordinary day. May we respond to God's call to love with confidence and with courage. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Are there any joys or concerns that need to be shared with the body today? Yes. Uh, my nephew has just been diagnosed with colon and bladder cancer, and he is starting chemo tomorrow. So I ask for prayers of strength and, and comfort for mm -hmm. he and his family. That's your nephew? My nephew. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then let us look to God in prayer. Oh, loving God, we thank you for the gift of this new day. You blessed us in so many ways in the ordinary and common activities of our lives. So today we ask you to open our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds, to see and hear the signs of your joy and gladness present in our own lives in the lives of others, and in the beautiful world you garden. May we see the common bush as a place from which you call our name, and the ground on which we stand and walk as your holy ground. Strengthen us for whatever your purpose may be, so it will be fulfilled in faithfulness and love and joy. O God who listens to all voices, you heard the prayers of the Israelites in ancient Egypt. Hear now our prayers, both spoken and silent. O oh God, we pray for peace where there is conflict, especially in the cities of our nation where protests have turned violent. We pray for food where there is hunger, and for those who seek to stock food pantries and bring water and food to those who are now without homes in Louisiana and Texas and other places that have been ravaged by the forces of nature. Gracious God, we pray for hope where there is despair, for health where there is sickness, especially for those in our congregational family who need your hand of healing, be it in body, mind, or spirit, and for that nephew who needs your love and your grace and your healing in a special way. We pray for faith where there is fear, and we raise to you school teachers, administrators, students, and parents who have so many questions and safety concerns about the coming school year. Oh God, we pray that you will give life where there is death, and we lift up those who grieve their loved ones who have entered your eternal rest. May your peace and comfort soothe their hurting and lonely spirits. Oh God of all, we pray for wise counsel and discernment from the leaders of our nations and throughout our world, that their words may be words that build up and give hope to the people they serve. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come to the end of our worship time, but remember God doesn't stay here. God goes with you wherever you go. God goes before you to guide you, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, beneath you to support you. So go in peace and do not be afraid. May the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>